wranglings in the party fails to take a decision about a substantive national chairman for the party. And on business news tonight, International Monetary Fund projects Nigeria's debt to GDP ratio to rise to 46.6% in 2024. On sports news tonight, Minister of Sports Development, Senator John Owaneno, gives assurances that a coach will be employed for the Super Eagles of Nigeria in the next two weeks. From Abuja, the nation's capital, the military vows decisive action against ethnic agitators and terrorists, warns them to desist from further attempts to destabilize any part of the country. And in international news from London, Ukraine's Prime Minister says there will be a third world war if Ukraine loses its conflict with Russia, as he urges the US Congress to pass a long-stalled foreign aid bill. We begin from the nation's capital, Abuja, where the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, the EFCC, is vowing to break all barriers to find the former governor of Kogi State, who is currently on the run, and bring him to face his arraignment. Uh, this came as Justice Amekanwite of the Federal High Court, Abuja, adjourned the suit instituted by the EFCC against Mr. Bello till April the 23rd. The adjournment is to enable substituted service and possible arraignment of Mr. Bello on the set date of the money laundering charges. Our correspondent, Emanuela Ekele, reports. The courtroom of Justice Emeka Nguite is quite a busy one today. Judging from the number of celebrated cases he will handle, one of such is the arraignment of the immediate past governor of Kogi State, Yahaya Bell. <laughs> Justice Nguite had on April 17th ordered the immediate arrest of the former governor for arraignment before him. That, however, did not happen as the governor was nowhere in sight. At the hearing, EFCC's counsel, Kemi Pinero, stated that Yehaya Bello's absence for arraignment was due to someone with immunity shielding him and removing him from his home. Pinero emphasized that immunity applies to individuals and not locations, and hinted at military assistance if needed to bring Bello for arraignment. In response, Yehaya Bello's counsel, Abdul Wahab Mohammed, cited a court order preventing EFCC from arresting or arraigning Bello, part of a fundamental rights suit where EFCC was involved and has appealed. Mohammed argued that EFCC's actions were unconstitutional and beyond the court's jurisdiction, noting that Bello isn't fleeing but under court protection. EFCC's counsel disagreed, citing a Kogi State High Court ruling ordering Bellu's appearance for arraignment. I've informed the court that by virtue of Section 287 of the Constitution, all persons are obliged to obey the court order. The court order is for its production on the next adjourned date, and the state will ensure that it's produced in court. Section 12 of AJA also allows a law enforcement agent to break down any premises where a defendant may be hiding. And so the state will invoke all its powers within the law to ensure that it's produced in court for the purpose of arraignment and it's in his own interest. So he can come and plead his innocence or his, he can take his plea as to whatever he wants to say. After listening to both parties, Justice Emeka Nguite adjourned the case to April 23rd for ruling on substituted service and possible arraignment of Yahaya Bello. Emanuela Ekele, Channels Television News. Meanwhile, Mr. Yahya Bello may have outwitted the EFCC yesterday and evaded arrest, but the anti-corruption agency has now declared the former Kogi state governor wanted for an alleged financial crime to the tune of 80.2 billion naira. The EFCC in a post on its Facebook page calls on those with vital information about Mr. Bello's whereabouts to reach the commission of the police. The declaration is the latest in what could now be described as a cat and mouse drama between Mr. Bello and the anti-corruption agency, which has vowed to ensure he faces trial. 
Meanwhile, the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Mr. Latif Fagwemi, has expressed concern over the obstruction of the EFCC in its effort to perform its statutory duty. The senior advocate of Nigeria notes in a statement that the EFCC has been giving power by the law to invite any person of interest to interact with them in the course of the investigation into any matter, regardless of their status. Mr. Fagwemi notes that the situation where public officials who are themselves subject of protection by law agents could set up obstruction, noting that a flight from the law does not resolve issues at stake but only exacerbates them. According to him, Nigeria has a vibrant judicial system that is capable of protecting everyone who follows the rule of law in seeking protection. The media office of the embattled former governor of Kogi State is accusing the EFCC of adjusting the charge against Mr. Yahya Bello to read 80 billion naira, and that the money has now stolen was now been stolen uh, was stolen in February 2016. Well, according to a statement today from the media team, this is barely three weeks before the former governor assumed office, raising concerns about this allegation. The statement reads in part. We want to draw the attention of the president to the fact that the abuse of court processes and prosecutorial powers by the EFCC is assuming a dangerous dimension that the head of the commission might not even have paid attention to. According to the media office, the EFCC boss is being misled into political persecution rather than diligent persecution by bad eggs within the system working with criminals masquerading as politicians. To more legal matters now, the hearing of the bail application of an executive of Binance Holdings Limited, Tigran Gambiaran, was stalled today at the Federal High Court in Abuja. This was in the assistance of the EFCC to reply to the defendant's response to the preliminary objection to his bail. The counsel of the EFCC told the court that in the defendant's response to the objection to his bail, the defendant raised new facts to which they would have to reply to. The defendant, through his counsel, questioned the prosecution's right to reply under the law. After taking arguments from both parties, Justice Emekanwite adjourned till April the 22nd for hearing of the bill application. And staying with the court, Justice Enyang Eko of the Federal High Court Abuja has refused to strike out the nine-count charge brought against the former governor of Anambra State, Mr. Willie Obiano, delivering ruling. Justice Eko held that security vote is paid from the Federation account and that the court cannot stop the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission from prosecuting the case concerning how it was spent. Mr. Obiano had challenged the powers of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission to prosecute him. He had urged the court to strike out the charges against him, describing them as an abuse of court process. Mr. Obiano was arraigned on January the 24th on a nine-count charge of theft to the tune of four billion naira. And more on the judiciary, a federal high court sitting in Kano has ordered the purported suspension of the national chairman of the All Progressives Congress, Abdullahi Ganduje, by his ward has now been halted. The ruling was delivered after Mr. Ganduje filed an ex parte motion seeking to enforce his fundamental right to a fair hearing. The respondents in the application are the police, the Department of State Services, the DSS, the Nigeria Security and Civil Defense Corps, and nine other individuals. On April the 16th, some APC executives in Dawakin Ward, Tofa, local government area of Kano State, purportedly suspended Mr. Ganduje over alleged corruption. And in the ex parte order delivered by the Federal High Court, he held that the purported suspension should not be implemented until the case is heard and determined. The judge subsequently fixed April the 30th to hear Mr. Ganduje's appeal. To political matters now, the National Executive Committee, NEC, which is the highest decision-making body of the People's Democratic Party, the PDP, has directed the National Working Committee of the party to reconstitute all the reconciliation committees to resolve wranglings in the party. The committee, however, failed to take a decision about the substantive national chairman of the party, even though it's one of the issues that the PDP Board of Trustees wants the party to address. Former Vice President Atiku Abubakar, Mr. Nyesom Wike and other prominent members of the PDP 
arrived the venue of the 98th National Executive Council meeting of the party in Abuja. Prior to this meeting, the PDP Board of Trustees met and urged the party to do the needful regarding the tenure of the acting national chairman, Mr. Umar Damagum. The current acting chairman has spent over a year in office, whereas as the usual practice of the party, the region from whence the national office hails from should have produced a viable candidate to complete the tenure of the former national leader. It is incumbent upon us to resolve this matter with utmost urgency, guided by transparency, fairness, and the best interests of our party and its members. The NEC is the party's highest decision-making body, and part of its duties is the ratification of decisions reached at the meetings of the various organs of the PDP prior to the NEC meeting. The acting national chairman sets the tone for the day's deliberations. It is expected that the decision and outcome of today's NEC meeting will strengthen our party, bring answers to the many questions in the heart of our members. Right. When it was a turn of the PDP governors, they submitted a pledge of support for the Damagam executive. We have been working assiduously to make sure that all the off season elections have been well funded, and of course the working committee is working. And we are solely, solely behind the current leadership of the PDP at the national working committee level and the BOT. The next meeting later went into a closed door session. When the doors opened, the National Policy Secretary briefed journalists on the key decisions taken by the council. NEC charges all others, leaders, critical stakeholders, and indeed all members of the PDP to close ranks, get to join every personal or group interest, and work together in the effort to reposition and return the PDP to power. NEC also approved the reconstruction of the party, oh sorry, the reconstitution of the party disciplinary and reconciliation committees of the party to further ensure the stability of the party. The PDP National Working Committee recently came under severe pressure from some members who want the Damagan executive to resign. As it stands, however, these people will have to wait for the time when the party may take a decision on this matter. In part two, after the break, APC governorship aspirants in Undo State Senator Jimo Ibrahim promises economic and political empowerment of women in the state if elected as governor. Please stay with us. When we celebrate the start of life's journey, we marry in colors. With our proudly Nigerian Duolox paints, now available in any color. Express your world however you want it. Visit a Duolox color center to get any color instantly. Duolox, let's color. The Duchess International Hospital caters to every aspect of a family's health needs. A one-stop shop for maternity and child health services, emergency medicine and critical care, medical and surgical subspecialties, dental and eye care, and a range of other subspecialties and services, all available at a single location right here in the heart of Ikeja. And it really doesn't matter if you're paying out of pocket using your HMO or private insurance. We focus completely on providing that world-class affordable health care for all the family at all times.
told that you can now print all your essential items for events without even having to leave your home? It's the Cast Prints Combo Deal for all events. Yes! Weddings, conferences, birthdays, burials, etc. Starting from 495,000 Naira only, you get 50 invites, 50 A2 size posters, 50 16 page brochures, one large backdrop banner, one roll up banner, 50 jotters with pens, and 50 souvenir carrier bags. Whatever event you're planning, we can adjust to your budget and quantities. Just send your pictures and other information through WhatsApp, and we shall send a design for your approval. Approve your design, and we will produce with super high quality digital print technology. We can even arrange delivery to your location. Call us now on 0913 156 or 0812 or visit our social media pages. Cast Prints, digital printing at super speed. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10, coming to you live on Channel's television from Lagos. A reminder of our main stories. EFCC declares immediate past Governor of Kogi State Yahya Bailu wanted as Federal High Court Abuja adjourns the suit filed against him by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission till April 23rd. Mr. Bailu accuses EFCC of adjusting charges against him. The Attorney General of the Federation warns against the obstruction of the EFCC in the performance of its statutory duties, says the Commission has power to invite any person of interest regardless of status. PDP National Executive Committee directs the reconstruction of all committees to resolve wranglings in the party, fails to take a decision about the substantive national chairman for the party. And Ukraine's Prime Minister says there will be a third world war if Ukraine loses its conflict with Russia, as he urged the US Congress to pass a long-stalled foreign aid bill. Head to Ondo State now, where ahead of Saturday's governorship primary of the All Progressives Congress, the APC, one of the top aspirants in the race, Senator Jimo Ibrahim, has been giving assurances of his preparedness to govern the state. This time, he is promising to empower women in the state economically and politically if he is elected as governor. Mr. Ibrahim said this while addressing the women at the Asheori Women's Conference in Akure, the Ondo State capital. Ondo women drawn from the 203 political words in the state gather in this auditorium for the Asheyori Women Conference convened by APC Senator and Governorship Aspirant Mr. Jimo Ibrahim. With women development and emancipation as a theme of the conference, Senator Ibrahim leverages on that to present his plans for women in the state. If elected governor of Ondo State, I will establish Bank of Ondo to empower women and all business people in the state, and everybody will buy a share of the bank. The leader of Ashiori movement and former secretary to the Ondo state government, Princess Oladu Niodu, assures the women that the administration of Senator Ibrahim would be beneficial not just to the women, but to everyone in the state. Senator Jimo Ibrahim. If you vote for Senator Jimo Ibrahim, he will appoint women into different positions in the state. In an interview with Channels Television on the sidelines of the program, Senator Ibrahim speaks more on what he has in store for women in the state. We're going to make sure that these women have what it takes to do their businesses, set up hospitals for them so that they will be able to deliver easily, you know, and also make sure that we attract a lot of investors. Like I told you, they will take, be taken care of through the Bank of Fondo in time of business development and practice. And again, like I told you, we are going to eliminate personal income tax. You will see the Minister of Finance under the Tribal Administration now is readjusting tax to develop the economy. That is what we call tax integration. So partial integration, take away part-time income tax, and then you will see life back. 
The conference, which was an interactive session, gave the attendees the opportunity to ask questions while Senator Ibrahim responded to all the issues raised. Away from politics now, the Chief of Defence Staff, General Christopher Musa, has given assurances of the military's preparedness to continue combating the illegal refining of petroleum products in Nigeria. Speaking at the meeting with the Minister of Petroleum Resources, Oil in Abuja, General Musa says that the blockage of the activities of economic saboteurs will assist in reducing the security challenges bedeviling the country. The Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, Minister... Heineken Lokoviri, on his part, believes the quickest way to solve the nation's economic challenges is through sustained oil production. We know all the challenges that uh, we're facing, uh, some of them directly, some of them indirectly. But uh, to assure you that the armed forces of Nigeria are fully in support of you and your ministry, and will continue to provide the necessary support to ensure that the country benefits from the God-given uh, resources uh, that we have. Um, I know there are a lot of challenges here and there, but together I know uh, we'll succeed and we'll succeed. And I want to congratulate you for so far since you came in. Uh, things are looking very, very positive. There's a lot of improvement within the area. Uh, a lot of the issues we're having, challenges with uh, uh, the illegal refineries, the pollution of the environment and all these things have gone drastically down and production is going up. Uh, this is a show that uh, you are really hitting the ground running and that we want to appeal to all Nigerians to join hands together with you and security forces to ensure that we secure whatever it is that God has given us. Today oil sells for over 90 you know, dollars per barrel. And if we ramp up production, and we reduce the level of oil tax and pipeline marginalization. We'll be able to raise the requisite money to be able to fund not only our budget, take off our forex problems, and then ensure that we we'll stabilize our economy as a country. There's no country in the world that doesn't prioritize security and investment, you know, in its oil access. Check it. Let's head over to Abuja Studios now where Gloria Umezoke is standing by to give us more on the news at 10. It's over to you, Gloria. Many thanks, Anne. We turn attention now to the military, which has issued a warning to ethnic agitators and terrorists to desist from further attempts to destabilize any part of the country, vowing to deal decisively with perpetrators of such act. The warning is coming from the Director, Defence Media Operations, Major General Edward Buba, while addressing a news conference in Abuja on the operations of troops in various theatres of operations. General Buba also cautioned against propaganda aimed at blackmailing the military. Defeating the terrorists and dismantling their military capabilities, their administrative capabilities, and political capabilities. Accordingly, we are continually boxing in the terrorists and dismantling their resupply routes. We are working decisively to kill the terrorists dismantle their networks and create conditions whereby they cannot carry out acts of terror or harm citizens of this country. For anyone, terrorists or cohorts that venture into our country to carry out acts of terror. Their fate is already decided. As I described earlier and mentioned again, they are just walking corpses.
Meanwhile, troops of Nigerian army deployed in the northeast have announced the rescue of Miss Lydia Simon, a Chibok girl who has been held captive by Boko Haram terrorists for 10 years. A statement from the Department of Army Public Relations explains that Miss Lydia, who was on serial number 68 among the abducted Chibok secondary school girls, was rescued along with her three children and troops conducting Operation Desert Sanity 3 around Ngoshe in Goza, local government area of Borno State. Miss Lydia, who was said to be five months pregnant at the time of her rescue, claimed to be from Pemi Town in Chibok. The statement adds that on April the 16th, 2024, Nigerian army troops deployed for operations in the north central region successfully ambushed and neutralized three terrorists who were on a mission to carry out attacks. To health matters, strengthened collaborations and synergies for better implementation of health programs remain crucial if Nigeria must attain the goal of eliminating HIV and AIDS by 2030. This is a submission of participants as the fourth biannual stakeholder engagement organized by the Center for Disease Control and other implementing partners. Our correspondent, Victoria Longjohn, reports. Key stakeholders and policy makers gather here for the fourth biannual stakeholders meeting organized by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and other implementing partners with the theme, Improving Public Health Programs Through Science. The prevalence of HIV AIDS in Nigeria is a concern, and these thought leaders are looking to review the progress, challenges, and the future strategies in combating HIV and AIDS, particularly with the introduction of science. Through evidence-based decision-making, the use of science to guide program design and implementation is a huge strength, and the transparent sharing of challenges and best practices makes our work stronger. The innovative ideas, the rigorous data, the uh, rigorous uh, uh, the theories and philosophical approaches need to be brought into a common space so they can be discussed and they can be debated so we can learn from each other so we can correct errors. Uh, this is how we tackle public health threats in general. This is uh, certainly how we're going to end HIV as a public health threat in the next few years. What has been a little weaker uh, that we are you know, trying to do better with is make sure that the science that is being um, identified is used to impact policy. So I would say, yes, Nigeria is absolutely there. The other thing that I will say has been uh, an enabler for that is President Tinubu's own Renewed Hope Agenda. And then um, having that domesticated by his health coordinating minister in the health renewal investment program. The director general of the National Agency for the Control of AIDS, NACA, who acknowledged some of the successes in eliminating HIV and AIDS in Nigeria, also stated that more work and collaboration needs to be done. The global response says um, there's need to have um, epidemic control of HIV by the year 2030. Um, and then, of course, there's this global target of 95, 95, 95. So we're trying to achieve this target even here in Nigeria. And we're doing well with the support of all our international partners. The message here is clear infuse science in the efforts by stakeholders in channeling a sustainable roadmap towards eliminating not just HIV and AIDS, but other disease outbreaks. Victoria Longjun for Channels Television News. And while the goal to deliver quality and affordable health services to 1.5 billion people by 2030 is one of the World Bank's latest priority as it moves to improve healthcare services globally. The plan hopes to cover infancy, childhood, adolescent and adulthood. The World Bank President, Mr. Ajay Banga, was speaking at an event tagged expanding health coverage at the ongoing spring meeting in Washington. Our correspondent, Sarah Achimogu, has the report. Gentlemen, again, top executives so of development institutions, policy makers and members of civil society organizations are converging on this venue to discuss issues of universal health coverage. Two billion people in this, in this world. Globally, health concerns continue to emerge, leaving persons without the hope of how to address their health concerns. But the World Bank is pledging to step in to bridge the gap. But if you want to broaden the access for those, 
then you have to widen your aperture to include that. And that's what we are trying to do in this effort, reach 1.5 billion people over the coming period with the WHO, with other partners, and make that happen by 2030. And reach them means really reach them. Don't just, I don't mean reach as in you put up a center and everybody in the area is counted. The president of the World Health Organization also shares his concerns regarding the health needs of the people. Since the birth of WHO, that's 76 years ago, uh, life expectancy has increased from 46 to now 74 average. So we, we're on, on, you know, progressing. But if you see the SDG goals the, directly, we, um, if you compare it with the SDG goals, we're off track. Yeah, very. And I don't think uh, without a very serious uh, catch up, uh, we may even reach uh, the, the SDGs. The Susan Thompson Buffett Foundation. Next, panelists mount the podium. One of them is Nigeria's Minister of Health. He speaks on how the government is prioritizing health and some of the challenges in meeting the universal health coverage targets. Challenges of human resources are certainly one that is not limited to us. We've doubled the intakes for our physicians, nurses, midwives, pharmacists to increase the production of health workforce in our country, to redistribute them, and also to create the enabling environment so that they can stay and function. That's one challenge. But financing is a key one. And the financing gap that we have, certainly we're very encouraged when we hear RJ mentioning 1.5 billion, and that's a significant commitment by the bank to actually do that but then backing it with the resources that are needed. The World Bank estimates that around 2 billion people globally face severe financial hardship when paying for health services. This is made more challenging owing to climate change, pandemics, conflict, aging, and a projected shortfall of 10 million healthcare workers by 2030. From Washington, D.C., Sarah Chimugu, Channels Television News. Still ahead on the news at 10, the International Monetary Fund projects that Nigeria's debt to GDP ratio will rise to 46.6% in 2024. Well, that's in business news. Let's join us again. ways to start your day. Whether you're in Lagos, Nigeria. In London or anywhere in the world. Or online. What a perfect start to our day, don't we? 7 a.m. Every weekday, we bring you a better way to start your day. state now where the government has presented 25 operational vehicles and surveillance drones to the Nigerian police. The Inspector General of Police, Kayode Ebuetokun, received the items aimed at strengthening security in the state. Governor Dakwa Biodon says that this has become imperative in order to adequately equip the men and officers for greater operational efficiency. To strengthen synergy with the Nigerian police force, the governor of Ogun State, Dagba Abiodu, and the State Executive Council host the Inspector General of Police, Kayode Ebetoku, who's on official visit to the state. <laughs> Next is the presentation of 25 operational vehicles and surveillance drones to the Inspector General of Police by the state government towards threatening the security and effective service delivery by officers and men of the force. We have a lot of people other traveling through our state, other coming here to study, other coming here to worship, other coming here or coming here to live, work and play. So we must ensure that we provide the needed security for that needed peace for them to thrive here. Okay. The Inspector General of Police, Kaode Egbetoku, who could not hide his joy 
commends Governor Dagwa Abiodun for the gesture as he joins the governor to inaugurate the vehicles. We are lucky we have a governor who is committed to protection of lives and properties in the state. I want to say that the drones that we are seeing today are, called, are surveillance drones, which we need in every aspect of police operations. With drones like this, we'll be able to see the criminals before they see us. We'll be able to plan our response to criminal incidences in the state. So I thank Your Excellency for this initiative, and I hope that other governors in Nigeria will emulate this. Commissioner of Police in the state, Abiodun Alamutu, who is taking custody of the vehicles and other accessories for effective policing of the state, promised better use of the vehicles. I want to express my deep appreciation to the executive governor of the state, Prince Dakwabiodun, for this uh, laudable support. The same appreciation goes to our inspector general of police too, as we are uh, assured that the support will keep coming and we don't have any choice but to put in our base. During the course of his three-day visit, the police boss visited the Alake and traditional ruler of Egbaland, Aremu Badibo, met with men and officers of the command and commissioned the new office complex of the command in the state capital. Africa's most awarded media organization, Channels Television, has been awarded the Rotary Club District 9110 Best Television Station in the coverage of its humanitarian activities for the year 2023 and 2024. The award ceremony, which also covered radio, prints and online categories, provided an opportunity for stakeholders to discuss the importance of partnership between the media and Rotary Club International. The 2023-2024 Humanitarian Reporting Awards organized by the Rotary Club District 9110, which held in Lagos, is an annual event designed to strengthen cordiality and partnership between Rotary and the media organizations with outstanding record of reportage of district humanitarian intervention projects of the club in the communities during the year in focus. The ceremony, which cuts across electronics, print and online, is used to highlight the importance of partnership between the media and the Rotary International. We believe we need to deepen this partnership so that we can continue to tell our stories better in Rotary. When you wink in the dark, nobody knows your work, wink. You know, but when you put on the lights and wink, everybody will know. So what we are doing today is to promote that partnership, we want it to be more robust, the media should support and promote the work we do in According to the district governor of the Rotary Club District 9110, Ifeinwa Ejezie, as well as the doyen of past district governors of the District 9110, Julius Adelusi Adeluyi, the humanitarian work of the club would not have been appreciated by the populace if the media had not publicized its activities and the need to bring back ethical standards in our national life. Today, I felt it to appreciate the media team, the journalists, the TV stations, the newspapers, and all that have partnered with us all through the year in telling these stories. Because we couldn't have done it by ourselves. We Rotarians believe that people who are wealthy may be envied, that people who are geniuses, intellectual capacity, may be respected, that people who are in power for the time being will be feared, but it is only people who have character that are trusted. And there is a trust deficit in this country. It's about time that the partnership between Rotary and the media would concentrate on an ethical revolution in this country. And it's very easy to start it. Already, Rotary has the tool. As far back as 1932, the four-way test was created. New telegraph 
Winners of the Rotary Humanitarian Reporting Awards emerged through a unique selection process by a committee using a bottom-top approach by 146 clubs and 4,000 Rotarians. The high point of the event was the recognition of Channel's television as the best television station for humanitarian reporting. The chairman channels media group, Mr. John Momo, represented by the general manager operations, Mr. Patrick Obuse, thanked Rotary International District 9110 for the award. At Channels TV, we see it as our job to be um, to give the relevant and timely, up-to-date information on what's happening to the people of our country, because we see ourselves as the defenders of the former states in Nigeria. Now, the Rotary Club is, as has been said, a great organization, one of the biggest NGOs, if not the biggest NGO in the world, and has far reaches across the world and even in Nigeria. And it is an honor and a pleasure for Channels Television to be associated with the Rotary Club. The 2023-2024 Humanitarian Reporting Awards may have come and gone, but issues highlighted will help in bringing about a better society if the media and Rotary International continue their cordial partnerships. 163 authors of children literature will compete for the 2024 edition of the prestigious Nigeria Prize for Literature. This was made known by the sponsors of that award, the Nigeria Liquefied Natural Gas Limited, NLNG, during a ceremony in Lagos to announce the commencement of that competition and to hand over entries to the judges. The Literature Award, which is now in its 20th year, has a prize of $100,000, while the Literary Criticism has a prize of ten thousand dollars the representative of NLNG mr. Andy Ode hands over entries for the 2024 Nigeria prize for literature to chairperson of the prizes advisory board who in turn hands over to the chairman panel judges so the panel of judges you'll be given a step no compromise on excellence the symbolic ceremony signals the commencement of the process that will produce winners for this year's edition the 2024 prize is focused on children's literature, with 163 entries for literature and 24 entries for literary criticism received. The handover of entries is a celebration of commitment and hard work put forth by every participant. And that includes you, the media, the judges, the administrative team working behind the scene, and most importantly, the writers who have decided to and confidently put in their works education. We thank them for what they are doing for Nigerian literature. While commending NLNG for sustaining the prize over the years, the chairperson of the advisory board says she expects nothing short of excellence from the judges. What NLNG expects all of us in, in this prize is excellence. There is no other criterion. Excellence, and that is always drummed into our ears. And anybody who has anything to do with this prize has to observe this criteria. So we, are, we assure you that this year will be as good as pre the previous years, if not better. We are happy that there are so much entries this year. For us, the judges, we know that me what that means. It means more work for us. But we are up to the task and we'll do our best to meet the deadline. We rely on our senior scholars and critics to guide us, and at the end, I believe we will successfully adjudicate, evaluate, and bring out the best out of the 160 or so entries. The organizers of the prize believe that the increase in entries for the children's literature cycle highlights the growing interest in Nigerian literature. No fighting. <laughs> Let's head over to the world of business now, where Ebong is standing by to give us the latest projection by the International Monetary Fund. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. <laughs>
Thank you, and it's definitely a week of projections from the IMF. Now, the International Monetary Fund, as the IMF, has projected a slight increase in Nigeria's debt-to-GDP ratio, which is expected to reach 46.6% in 2024 from 46.3% in 2023. The IMF, which made this known during the ongoing spring meetings in Washington, D.C., says the rise suggests increased borrowing potentially for infrastructure and social projects or to counter economic shocks. While concerns arise about fiscal sustainability, the report indicates that Nigeria's debt remains manageable when compared to other countries. And the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Mr. Olayemi Kadoso, has been reacting to the views that the regulator's intervention in the foreign exchange market is responsible for the depletion of the country's foreign reserve. Mr. Kadoso who was speaking at a session of the ongoing IMF World Bank spring meetings in Washington, D.C., says that the CBN is working on policies to support the market and ensure stability of the exchange rates. What you've seen with respect to the shifts in our reserves is a shift that you find in anybody's, in any country's reserve situation, um, where, for example, um, debts are due and certain payments need to be made. They are made because that is also part of keeping your credibility intact. And other times, money comes in and, you know, takes it up again. And if you watch in the next couple of days, We've, I, mean, I think between yesterday and today, we had about 600 million US that came into the, into the reserves account. So I wouldn't let people get too excited about, about this thing. All I will say is that we are looking towards ensuring that we have a market that operates on its own, willing buyer, willing seller, and price discovery. That's where we're going to, the, the, the shifts you've seen in our reserves has really you know, little or nothing to do with defending any Naira, and that's certainly not our objective. Now, the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Commission, FCCPC, has sealed for you supermarkets, formerly known as Amigo Supermarkets, a major retail outlet in Abuja over sharp practices by the management and staff. The store was sealed during the FCCPC's enforcement exercise in part of the nation's capital. The leader of the enforcement team, Mr. Adamo Abdullahi, who is the acting executive vice chairman of the agency, says the commission understands the significant financial strain rising prices are placing on Nigerian households and steps are being taken to address this issue. Now, the chairman of Nigeria Electricity Regulatory Commission, NEC, Sanusi Gauba, says if the recent increase in electricity tariff is to be reversed, the federal government would have to pay up to 3.2 trillion naira as subsidy for the power sector in 2024. Mr. Garba stated this at a meeting with the House of Representatives Committee on Power. According to the NEC chairman, current investments in the sector are not enough to guarantee steady power supply. And if nothing concrete is put in place to address issues in the sector, including foreign exchange fluctuation and non-payment for gas, the sector will be doomed. And it's back to the red zone for the domestic equities market. Here's Dominic Iwiwu with the details. Hello and welcome to the Stock Market Report. I'm Dominic Iwiwu. It's the fourth day of trading on the NGX and yet again the market closes in the red as the all share index drops by 0.06% to close at 99,845 points below the 100,000 points with a market capitalization of 56.469 trillion naira. The banking counter, which closed positive Wednesday, has shed those gains and is down by 0.63%, while the consumer goods closes in the green with 0.14%, and the oil and gas sector remains unchanged. With one day left of trading on the NGX, Many are hopeful that the bull will come out like it did Wednesday, but today, the bear has the market. Thank you, Dominic. We'll keep our fingers crossed for the coming out of the bull. But let's check out the performance of other major stock markets around the world, see how they performed.
And that's it on Business News. It's back to you, Anne. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. You will. Kenyan President William Ruto has announced the death of the country's military chief, General Francis Mondi Ogola, and 11 other personnel following a helicopter crash northwest of the capital, Nairobi. Here's Yaman Puse with more international news in around the world in five. Good evening and welcome to the channel's studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Ukraine's Prime Minister says there will be a third world war if Ukraine loses its conflict with Russia, as he urges the US Congress to pass a long-stalled foreign aid bill. Denis Shimhal expressed careful optimism that US lawmakers would pass the hotly contested measure, which has $61 billion earmarked for Kyiv. The House of Representatives is set to vote on the package this Saturday. The proposal includes funding for Israel as well as the Indo-Pacific. This is not the first time Ukraine has issued such an alarming warning about the consequences of its potential defeat. Qatar's Prime Minister is reassessing its role as a mediator between Israel and Hamas. Ahead of, of the escalation, uh, we've been in an intense conversation. Qatar has had a key role, along with Egypt and the U.S., in trying to secure a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas and the release of Israeli hostages. But Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdul Rahman Al Thani said Doha had been exploited and abused. Attempts to secure a ceasefire have been delicate and largely unsuccessful, but the links Qatar has with all sides, including close ties to Hamas, are regarded as crucial to achieving any breakthrough. United States President Joe Biden has called for a tripling of tariffs on some steel and aluminium from China. It is the latest protectionist policy to be embraced by Mr. Biden as he campaigns for re-election against Donald Trump, who was known for his tough trade stance against China. The White House said the proposal was aimed at protecting U.S. jobs against unfair competition. Prices are unfairly low because China's steel companies don't need to worry about making a profit because the Chinese government has subsidized them so heavily. Look, right now, my U.S. trade representative is investigating trade practices by the Chinese government regarding steel and aluminum. If that investment confirms these anti-competitive trade practices, then I'm calling on her to consider tripling the tariff rates for both steel and steel. Operations at Dubai Airport are still severely disrupted as heavy rains continue to batter the United Arab Emirates and neighboring countries. The storm pounded the UAE on Tuesday, flooding roads and sections of the busy international airport. Flash floods have now killed 20 people in Oman and one in the UAE. Some inbound flights have resumed on Thursday, but on the whole, Dubai International Airport, a major travel hub, is barely functional. Scientists say a deadly heat wave in West Africa and the Sahel was impossible without human-induced climate change. Temperatures soared above 48 degrees Celsius in Mali last month, with one hospital linking hundreds of deaths to the extreme heat. Researchers say human activities like burning fossil fuels made temperatures up to 1.4 Celsius hotter than normal. A separate study on drought in southern Africa said El Nino was to blame rather than climate change. A number of countries in the Sahel region and across West Africa were hit by a strong heat wave that struck at the end of March and lasted into early April. The heat was most strongly felt in the southern regions of Mali and Burkina Faso. Prince Harry has officially listed the US as his primary residence, according to documents filed in the UK. The change was revealed in a filing for sustainable tourism charity Travelist, which was founded by Harry, recording the Duke under his full name, Prince Henry Charles Albert David, Duke of Sussex. Harry and Meghan have lived in California since they quit roles as senior working royals in March 2020. And a group of ballerinas have broken the Guinness World Record for the largest assembly of dancers on point within a minute. Three, two, one, go! Dancers gathered at New York City's Plaza Hotel for the attempt. The ballerinas had to remain on tiptoes in unison for over a minute. The 353-strong group beat the previous record of 306 ballerinas on point, set in 2019. It's about 
um, giving for children something and for giving for young dancers something meaningful. I need to make sure that they are in very prof professional ballet clothes and shoes and that they need to stand and point simultaneously in one minute. It means that they cannot, drop, they cannot drop off their toes. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the channel's studios in Lagos. <laughs> Thanks indeed, Simon. On Sports News tonight, as part of a working visit to Lagos, the Minister of Sports Development, Senator John Waneno, has paid a courtesy visit to the Chairman Channels Media Group, Dr. John Momo, at our global headquarters earlier today. The Sports Minister was received by the Chairman and some management team. After the meeting, the Minister had an exclusive interview on our flagship sports program, Sports Tonight, where he spoke on the vacant Super Eagles managerial position. The, 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 the first responsibility, you know, of getting the coach, you know, lies with the NFF. And I've been in touch with the NFF because I think that it's um, Nigerians didn't expect that after AFCON and after, you know, the, the, the contract, you know, with Coach Pesairo came to an end and wasn't renewed. Nigerians didn't expect that it would stay as long and not have a coach yet. But the NFL is conscious and is mindful that our next World Cup qualifiers are coming up in, in June. What I can assure is that in the next one, two weeks at the most, that you know, the senior national team will have a coach. Um, my engagements and interactions with the NFF you know, suggest and indicate to me that the NFF is conscious of the expectations of Nigerians the NFL is conscious that they cannot afford to lead the country, you know, to another, you know, um, non-appearance at the next World Cup. The NFL knows what Nigerian football lost not being at the last, you know, World Cup, and they're working very hard, you know, to make sure that it doesn't happen anymore. All right, so there you go, the sports uh, minister, Senator John Owaneno. Let's bring you up to speed with results from the Europa League. Games played earlier today where Liverpool's hopes of ending Jurgen Klopp's reign with the Europe, European trophy are over after they failed to overturn the first leg deficit against Atalanta. AS Roma progressed to the Europa League semi finals after beating Serie A rivals AC Milan 2 1 at the Stadio Olimpico to qualify 3 1 on aggregates. Meanwhile, West Ham. United bowed out of the Europa League at the London Stadium after playing a one or draw with Bayer Leverkusen, losing out 3 1 on aggregate. Away from football, Casper Ruud racked up a tour leading 26 win of the season by reaching the Barcelona Open quarterfinals. The world number six from Norway eased past Jordan Thompson of Australia 6 1 6 4. And Ruud needed just 73 minutes to secure victory. He will now face Matteo Arnardi in the last eight. Oh, it's not low falling. It really is. And that's it on sports. I'm Kelly. It's back to Anne. Thank you, Kelly. And the main news again. The EFCC today declared the immediate past governor of Kogi State, Yahya Bello, wanted as Federal High Court Abuja adjourned the suit filed against him by the EFCC till April the 23rd. Meanwhile, Mr. Bello has accused the anti-corruption agency...